get my recording going. I'm not going to be doing this one live. I'm going to be doing this one on Memrex. And if I can find my music, I know it's here somewhere. Here we go. From the studio in the bonus room above the garage, on the north side of Cary, at the foot of Mount Belzoni, this is the Triangle Talk Show. I forgot the triangle. I've got the triangle out of the way for Tuesdays with Tillis. Here's the triangle. A lot of people will miss it. All right. Sequestered in that studio... As usual, this is falling apart as I as I per- do the show. <laughs> Sequestered in that studio, I am Gary Pierce, and I am solo as the host for this midweek show. Uh, my usual co-hosts, Jen, Brendan, and Sarah, the best team of podcasters in North Carolina. They all have real jobs. And um, uh, I am retired. I can pretend that this is what I do. Not for a living. There's no money in it. <laughs> But it's, it's what I tell people that I, I do. I meet people. You don't meet people anymore because, you know, the COVID thing. But when I meet people out there in the world back in the old days, what do you do? Oh, I do a podcast. Oh, a podcast. And, and because everybody in the world now does a podcast, I'll say, and what podcast do you do? Only a few of them don't do any. Uh, this is episode 102 for July 21st, 2020. Convicted? innocent question mark and it's a judicial question mark podcast it's a lot of question marks we'll find out why in a minute um triangle talk show is a youtube show and it's a podcast for the triangle area of north carolina we talk about anything we want to we aim more or less at things of interest to you triangularians i'm learning to do the air quotes thing Uh, We are unfair and unbalanced on the left-leaning side of politics when we get political, I think kind of today. Any semblance or balance of balance is provided by our newest host, Sarah Wagner. She's a libertarian. She's not here today, so there's no semblance of balance. The website is triangletalkshow.com. The Facebook group is Triangle Talk Show. YouTube channel, Triangle Talk Show. Twitter, at Talk Triangle. Send me a, a tweet sometime if you know how to do that podcast wise we are just about every place apple music still called itunes on windows why would anyone anybody want to use that on windows we are on TuneIn, on spotify along with michelle obama apparently stitcher google podcasts we are everywhere you want to be and now on with the show as a privileged old suburban white male. It's a lot of stuff to describe me. I have had a thorough understanding about the way the courts work in America from TV, the way most of you have. Uh, From LA law to Boston legal, I have a thorough understanding of the way the courts work. My current exposure is a CBS show called All Rise. Uh, That features a newly appointed black female judge The show is unusual in that it comes from the judge's perspective and a black female judge. That's an indicator of how far television has come. Not sure about the rest of the world, but but television. However, I am pretty sure that that show has been sanitized for my protection as a privileged old white male TV viewer. My uh, real life experience is probably also similar to yours. Uh, Traffic court. (laughs) My biggest fear was getting points on my record that would raise my insurance rates. There's another corner of the justice system, um, jails and prisons. And I made it through a few episodes of Orange is the New Black before I decided I didn't like that series very much. TV and movies do sometimes, I guess kind of often, they show some gritty, violent sides of prisons. But it's still TV. It's not my life. I personally spent one night in an unlocked cell in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, after being stopped for speeding. 
and the three dollars that I had on me wasn't quite enough to make bail or whatever I needed to pay, whatever that was, I don't remember. This was in 1969. I was 20 years old, and the cops there put me in a quiet section of the county jail because they didn't want to put this naive young white boy in from the Chicago suburbs, didn't want to put him in with the local drunks. Yeah, I've had a rough life. Uh, My guests for the show have had a different experience, and let me bring them up here. There we go. And turn on the sound. Uh, These are moms. They have sons in prison. One, as I understand it now, one mom will say her son is innocent. One, maybe not so much. I don't know whether that's true. The Triangle Talk Show does not have an investigative unit. We are here to let them tell their stories and maybe ask them some questions. Questions that they have probably heard and answered a dozen or more times before. Uh, Questions that occur to me from my privileged suburban white male liberal background that I hope won't offend them. And uh, on the left is Elizabeth Crudup. Elizabeth has been on the show many times before. Uh, Elizabeth, you bring us some of the more important and urgent stories that we have covered on the show. And your heart has always seemed kind of light. You have fun with us. But I can see on your Facebook feed that there is also anger and heartbreak, and it's got to be there for you every day because your son has been in prison, what, since 2013? Welcome back to the show. Thank you. He's been there. He was arrested in 2012, and he's been in prison since 2014. So he spent two years in jail before he he, uh, he went to prison. Okay, you can explain to us the difference between jail and prison as we, as we do the um, show. I'm sure there's a difference. Yes, uh, jail is is uh, pre-trial bondage, I guess, and prison is after trial bondage. Yeah. One is sheriff's department, local, county stuff, and the other one is state or federal level okay. uh, incarceration. And your son's name is Shannon. Shannon Yamodi. I know the have to the end of the Y, but Shannon Yamudi is uh, his name. Um, I really wanted to give Miss Rose the platform to to present her son's uh, situation. What I found out uh, when I started fighting for my son is that we are uh, many sister mothers out here in a very strange club, in a very strange club, because many times it is us, the mothers, who are left to be the voice of our children as they struggle for their freedom. Okay. And so your friend is Rose, Rose Poole. Rose, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, so Elizabeth, you want Rose to tell her story first? I'd, I'd like Rose, if, if she, could, she could start and uh, let us know from the beginning, so we all know um, not only the wrong, but the hurt, the damage um, this causes outside of just the physical incarceration of a human being wrongfully, um, the damage and devastation that runs through. Okay, Rose, it's your turn and take your time. Okay, um, I'm going to try not to get too emotional because normally when I do talk about this, I get really emotional. Um, my son has been, he's, he probably spent like a year, a year and a half in the county jail and he was sentenced in 20, he was arrested in 2017 and was served and got his sentence in May of 2018. But, um, my daughter says no, but. Tell her to join us. Come on in. Can you join? She won't because her hair's not done. Well, <laughs> um, Roderick. Okay, he was he was arrested in 2018, and he was sentenced in 2019, and he was sentenced to 28 years. And um, what, what I was, just what was he like, arrested and convicted for? He was convicted on a drug offense. And And for um, for how long? 
he got 28 years for a drug offense that must be yeah. there must be selling then yes yeah dealing which dealing can be just having too much on you well that's not in his case um they pretty much used a girl that he dated and that had three kids by him and when they decided to go separate ways it's more or less that um they used her as an informant and they just really used her. They used an emotional um, drug addict woman, which they were all doing drugs, including my son. And they all lived in the same house except for the girlfriend. And with it being um, three white male, two black m- males other than my son they were sentenced to the harsher crime the white males were sentenced from three to not even a year in jail and your son Um, and your son 28 years and my son got 28 years do you have any reason i mean the surface reason is because he was black and the rest were white what what was behind I that? Feel I, I just feel like the injustice of it, and uh, I'm more disappointed in the system when I went to the sheriff department with information with two dirty cops, and he claimed to have investigated them, which I know he didn't, and he told me if I continue to investigate that it would make it harder on my son, and it did. And I let my son know what the sheriff said, but he told me, he said, mom, some of the stuff that they're saying is not true. So continue. I said, even though he said it's going to make it hard on you, do you want me to continue? And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. And I continued. And during the time of the trial, I know that one of the police officers, um, act as though as I was on trial, he got on the stand and he, committed perjury um, against me. He was saying things, you know, which we know they listen to our phone conversations. And one of the phone conversations me and my son had, the, the officer got on the stand and told a lie. It wasn't true. And I went to the sheriff with it to let him know that it wasn't true. And he said he had no way of finding out. But if you recorded that conversation, I know you had a way of finding out what the truth was. And then the other officer, him and my son was having a relationship with one of the informants. Asked him to investigate that. He soon told me that the girl that supposedly been involved with my son and this officer, he couldn't find them. In which I knew it was a story because she worked not even probably 10, 15 minutes away from the sheriff department. He told me that she um could be in Canada somewhere by now. And I just felt like he didn't try to investigate it. He didn't care. When we hear stories like this, those of us that are not involved, we're just you know, maybe we hear them on the news or read them in the newspaper. It's it's a sort of a he said, she said, or he said, he said without tangible proof without evidence without recordings without video and video has has brought to light the kinds of things that you have been describing that that heretofore we wouldn't believe or we wouldn't know for sure were true because nobody was there we couldn't tell you know it's just one word against another suddenly a lot more video is showing up and is um in in many cases doing a pretty good job of proving one side or the other and usually the side that it's proving is the complainant side saying look what the police did all you've got is your word and and against their word is that am i understanding that correctly um well i wouldn't go as far as to say he said she said because i had some of the informants that was involved in roger's case write letters and have them notarized and i even took them to the sheriff department they just push that to the side. Okay, so you and had. These, I'm sorry, you had witnesses, and they and they disregarded the witnesses. 
right because they were informants. They co-defendants, were... as I can say, co-defendants. All right. So, so the and one of the things that the um, the prosecutors will try to do is the I guess the technical term is impeach defense witnesses. So, I, I don't care what your story is; you're not believable. Mm-hmm. So that sounds like that's what's happened to you guys. But saying that's the crazy part, though, because nine times out of ten, if um, you had someone that's been in prison or in, um, that has a record, they can get on the stand and no one believed them. But in my son's case, they did. Okay, these these were witnesses who were incriminating your son and they got believed when in other circumstances. they And they were all they, doing the same thing, yes. And these were white? Um, um, three were white and two were black. Okay, but they, but they all got rounded up to say the same things. And any idea if they were promised something for saying that, a lenient sentence? Um, one of the black men were promised that they wouldn't bother his dad. You know, they was trying to make it look like his dad was involved in the drug deal. And he was promised that. And then another one, they were promised lesser sentences. This does sound like every um, police and law or a legal TV show that I've ever seen on TV, um, you know, where the prosecution's making a deal and, you know, some, I guess sometimes that, you know, that's the way they get someone to tell them something, but then are they getting them to tell them something they want to hear or are they getting, getting the truth? How do you tell? And, and that's, and that's the thing. That's the thing. That's the, the fabrication that these assistant DAs do. They, they fabricate it to create what to them would be the fastest way to get this case out of their face. Yeah. They, have, they are great inventors of situations. They have set, you know, scenarios and they'll plug in people as needed to fit the scenario and get this case out of their face as fast as possible, not considering the life they have just destroyed as they did it. Because guess what? That ADA gets to go home at the end of the day, you know, to his or her family at the end of the day, who cares if a young man now sits in prison for 28 years? Yes. They don't care. Their life is not affected left or right by it, you know? So right. Um, and, and just, and, and just, I'm going to like ask like a quick question, Ms. Rose, like how, how long have you, been um, advocating and fighting to try and get any kind of uh, progress and getting your son heard or reheard uh, for release. I've been, I've been fighting for the last two years. You know, like I, you know, once this happened to my son, I just couldn't believe that stuff like this actually ha- happened with me back and forth in court for a year or longer with him. I just, be- I couldn't believe anything like this was happening in the courtroom. And just, to, I guess what really shocked me is when the officer got on the stand and told a lie on me, I'm like, they actually do this, but we are supposed to trust and believe in them. So therefore our judges are believing what they're saying when it's it's not it's no truth to it and and i decided then that i'm going to fight for my son and any other i care i don't care if they black or white but if i see that they're being mistreated and the injustice with the system i want to help in any way i can i want to advocate for anybody that's incarcerated for so many years Mm -hmm. and it shouldn't even be like that because they actually get on the stand and tell lies. And then when I seen what the judge, I mean, I sent what the sheriff told me he was going to make it harder for my son because we were going back and forth to court. And then, you know, my son had to get another lawyer because one of the lawyers that he had, he ended up dying. And, Mm -hmm. um, so, um, then when he told me they were going to make it harder for my son, I seen it because that's when they start bringing in a witness. And then I can see the, the, the different demeanor with the judge. 
once he seen, because they was trying to say that my son was giving a pregnant woman drugs, which was his girlfriend when they were doing drugs together. Mm. But, um, and then so a mom an got, so the, yeah, she was an addict. Yeah, on so her the, own, she was an addict. On her yeah, own. she, um, when I talked to the mom, she, she's been an addict ever since she was like 14. So the judge heard that and then his opinion shifted? No, the judge seen that the woman was white. Then he knew that my son was dealing with a white girl. When the white mother got on the stand, his whole demeanor changed. Okay, so I, so race has played a huge part in what you've been seeing. I believe so now. Yeah. Once I seen that, because the judge didn't act anything like that, but once he seen that this girl's mother was white, his whole is just like his whole attitude towards my son just changed. Now it sounds like um, probably not too different from me. Your experience with the court system was watching TV shows until you got into it yourself. And when you saw what you may have seen on a um, on TV on a you know a drama happen to you in person, that seemed to have had a stronger impact you weren't expecting that to happen to you in real life i wasn't i'm i'm like i'm still in shock now to the point where it just didn't only affect my son going to prison it affected dss taking my grandkids and giving them to the white side of the family and i haven't seen my grandkids and it's been a year today so the story keeps getting worse yes and it's it's amazing the the way the system eviscerates not just the life of the person that's in the prison system but everyone connected to them anyone who stands by them the family or friend your life gets eviscerated by the system and um the system totally totally weaponizes itself to make your lives as miserable as possible for as long as possible. Um, I I remember just very recently, have I even let people know um, where I live? I I would change, literally change addresses every six months or so, I'd be somewhere else. And I wouldn't tell anyone where I am. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a time I actually had to go into, into the home of strangers. That is how great the insecurity is. That is how great the the evil that comes in when you get entangled with the, uh, I would call it a criminal justice system, but let's call it the legal system here in the United States as um, African Americans. Um, Was this shit because you, know, you were afraid or because you were being threatened? Oh, both. I was afraid and being threatened all at the same time. <laughs> you know, uh, again, once again, um, my son, Shannon, also was dating a, a, he had a white girlfriend. Had nothing to do with the crime, but he did have a white girlfriend. Uh, they had been seeing each other through high school. He was actually uh, hanging out with her more than he was at home. Her family seemed accepting. He had somebody. Um, he he played. My son played in a rock band, and um, because he is a six foot something African American man, you know, most people think he was listening to rap music. My son didn't listen to rap music. My son is amazed by guitars. He's African has a lot of guitars and rock music has a lot of guitar playing. So him and his friends were playing a, in a in a rock band locally doing local gigs and they'd actually come home from one of those gigs one night and now it's like 2 30 3 a.m people have blacked out fallen asleep my son had had gone my son would work as a a electrician's apprentice during the day and do the music thing at night so he was exhausted they fell asleep 
in the middle of the night this lady comes in white lady comes running screaming help me help me help me my daughter just shot me my daughter did something to me. my daughter had something to do with this um the white people where shannon was staying they saw her uh, shannon's friend saw her and left like run run into the house closing the door you know shannon grabbed the lady said i'll stay with you the grandma who was in the house now she'd been awakened by all the noise she calls the police shannon is out there on the step with this lady injured bleeding it was a dark cul-de-sac so you he waved down the ambulance to make sure that they knew exactly where she was he stayed with her until she was loaded into the ambulance truck and he was like make sure she's okay please let let us know is she going to be okay that was now the ambulance and all came at around 4 a.m this now became an uh, the whole cul-de-sac now became an sbi like crime scene and all the witnesses said yes we saw a white male in a hoodie uh baggy clothes running that away you know the imprints you know timberland boot like thing imprints show the direction where this person is handprints on the glass sliding window everything was like they know who did this um somewhere in the sheriff notes um i was looking at what the notes that the sbi turned in somewhere the sheriff of franklin county at the time his name is sheriff jones shows up and one very meticulous sbi agent wrote down we had the suspect excuse me handcuffed in the car Sheriff Jones came and said, release the suspect and get that black boy under the tree. Mm. Mm. So they they had a a uh, the person they thought did it. And the sheriff's deputy the sheriff, the sh- not the sheriff's deputy. The, sh- the actual sheriff of the county told them to then, release that suspect and because your son was black, arrest him He was instead. the only black person out there. He was the only black person out there. Yeah. But my son did not see himself as a black person out there. He saw himself as... Um, you, described him as, as a good, you described him as a good Samaritan. Someone who was he helping. was just literally not only was he a good Samaritan, he just saw himself as another human being standing mm-hmm. with other human beings. All that sheriff saw was black, the color of his skin. He said, Why should we con- you know arrest a guilty white person when we've got a perfectly fresh black person sitting yes, here? Mm. These are stories and, that that ring out of 1940, 1920. It's a To Kill a Mockingbird story. Mm. It, it happened t- ten, less than 10 years ago. I know these are, say Elizabeth has, has been on the show as a lighthearted um, and, and very... Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going, to, I'm going to take your picture off and let you compose. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Light, lighthearted, enjoying life while your son has been in prison like that. Not, not, not thinking about your son. It's just that it, it hasn't infused every aspect of your of your uh, um, of your being, but it's always been there. And uh, and I, I guess I can almost have a hard time believing I ever see you smile. It is, um, it is, um, as I said, this, this becomes when, when the fight starts, when you realize that the system has got nothing to do with justice and everything to do with the incarceration of as many, uh, young, and they get them young, I would say between 18 and 21, let me say 17 and 21 there, they get them young in huge bunches, no due process. They are pushed for, 15 to 30 something years into a system that Mm -hmm. is impossible to get out of. 
they're literally it's like literally the slave catcher coming and catching you and selling you into slavery that's what it feels like and um the resilience of those who survive it my son endured two years of solitary confinement solitary confinement as in he only saw the tops of people's heads like the shadow of the guard walking past he was cut off no phone calls uh, no communication with um, me, his sister, none of us. Uh, he was beaten up periodically. If the sheriff wasn't doing it himself, it was one of the deputies in charge at the, at the jail, not the, not the captain, but the, he, had, he had a guy in that jail system who would beat him up. Uh, or one of the uh, other uh, jail people jailed up would be beaten up with mm. guarantees to be let go in a day or two. Did they, know, did they and, even bother to make up an excuse for doing that? Or did, did, is that oh, just they, what happened? They told him, this, this is what happened. Um, I complained, complained, complained. My son was moved to Nash County, and that's where I really got to see him for the first time um, in Nash County. Um, the chief judge in Franklin County at that time had to get off the bench, get in his car, and drive me and him, and I had a few other uh, ladies who are also mothers of wrongfully incarcerated sons, drove to the jail and went into the jail to get my son. They had never seen the judge in the jail. The how, sheriff- How did you get him to do that? The, the sheriff, the judge had asked, said produce, because we did a habeas corpus. I had to find out what a, a habeas corpus was. Did a habeas corpus, the judge says, bring this boy. Um, the sheriff says, no. The judge says, bring him. The sheriff says, I'm an elected official just like you are. I don't have to listen to what you're saying. Mm, mm, mm. So the judge said, okay. Literally told us, get up, follow my car. I mean, they hear that little, it was so surprising, a little Toyota Tercel said, get in my car. We're going to the jailhouse went to the jailhouse and told the uh, captain uh, at that time, he told him, we're coming in, bring Shannon. And we actually got to go back into the jail to get Shannon. And Shannon had nails this long, his hair, which is usually cut down, was now matted up. And uh, he had said he had been picking the walls so he doesn't go crazy. Um, but, um, that was, um, they moved him to Nash County. He was in Nash County for seven days. They picked him up early one Sunday morning. They picked him up and they took him back to, Har to Franklin County. They beat him up and they said, this could be the rest of your life. If you don't take a plea, at least in prison, you'll know you'll live. You'll have mm. a better chance of, of staying alive. Take the plea. And so Shannon called me and said, Mama, you have me no matter what. Mm. I said, Shannon, what's going on? Mm. He said, Mama, do you have me no matter what? I said, honey, no matter what. My son hung up and took the flea. For a crime, he didn't even know what happened. He didn't even know what happened to the woman. And, and the sheriff went on TV. The sheriff went on TV and... um and formed his own story, had his nephews or whatever, formed their own story, WRAL, WTVD. And this is what gets me. At the end of that plea agreement thing, the lady, the victim, who now, remember her daughter was the one who had been doing all this to her, uh, the sheriff had said, oh, they had to make a connection between my son and the, and the girl. So they said my son was sleeping with this girl Yes, my son had a white girlfriend, but it wasn't this girl. Okay. So they said my son had been sleeping with this girl and my and this girl was giving him pills and said, you'll have more sex and pills if you kill my mama. And uh, at the very end, when, the, when that plea deal is signed or whatever, the victim stands up and says, my daughter never slept with this man. Mm. Ne and this is, and the judge is hearing this, sentencing my son to decades in prison. 
And the victim has stood up and said, my son never slept with this man. But that was after he had already signed a plea? There was still in the space. There was still the judge. This was not like, you know, two days after or five hours after. This was literally minutes. The ink is not even dry on the paper. My son is hauled in. The, the thing is signed and the, the, they said, oh, we want to get a, a statement from the victim, whatever. And she says, my son never, uh, my daughter never slept with this man. That was the only connection because the SBI had done the Facebook searches, the phone searches, all of that. They had done all of that and there was evidence that the, D, that the DA refused to admit that showed that there was never any connection between my son and this girl. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm, I think I missed something so, in your story. Why did he sign a plea for something he didn't do? Because he wanted to live. This was two years later in solitary confinement and beating up. This is torture. Most people, they said most people would have break it in, in about 11 months, eight, eight to 11 months is the average, you know? And this is while he, he was still in jail awaiting trial. Yep. And just to let you know, my son's name had been removed from the docket. Like you could not walk up to the Franklin County Courthouse and say, um, when is Shannon Yamudi's next case? So where is Shannon Yamudi's name? Unless I told you who was in, in that jail house, there was no court documentation that indicated my son was in that jail house. A judge by the name of Judge Height um, signed an order removing him from the computer system completely. And I said, how many people are languishing back there? How many people have been removed, just removed? So you're literally a captive of the state. No court date, no visitation, no phone calls. You're in there. And that, not the way it's supposed to work. You had mentioned habeas corpus, which is that Latin thing that says produce the body. Yes. Not the dead body, the, the live person. It, you know, one agency can tell another Let's have that person because we don't think you're holding them uh, legitimately. Rose, we see that your husband has arrived. Yeah. Uh, if he wants to come in and join you, that would be cool. Come on. Come on. Um, like Elizabeth was saying, with um, you asked her why did he sign a plea. And a lot of times um, they feel as though that's the only thing they have is a plea. Because when my son sign his plea is because the lawyer that I was telling you about that passed away, he never went to the jail probably but one time and he pretty much pushed that plea on him so he didn't have no other choice but to sign. Once my son seen in his paperwork that there was a lot of lies, that's when he wanted to fight, you know. He wanted to fight for his life because he knew some of the stuff that was in his paperwork wasn't true. So a lot of times they're pretty much forced into signing a plea bargain because I felt like uh, he had insufficient counseling because this man was sick. And I don't think he worked hard enough to even, you know, try to save my son or get him a, a lighter sentence. It's, yeah. it's terrible when they push that plea bargain on um a lot of guys. So another aspect of your story is just bad representation. Scoot your camera over there a yes. little bit and introduce that handsome gentleman next to you. That's, my husband's name is Dwight Poole. Dwight, it's good to meet you. My name is Gary. I'm the, the host of this uh, little television show. I'm glad to have you here. Well, how you doing, sir? Uh, and uh, Rose has told us um, the story. I don't know if you've got a different perspective or something to add to it, but if you do, uh, what stands out in your mind as to what's happened to your son? I, I say he's a, a, a he, he's really a victim because you know he he's probably in his group he's probably was the most productive citizen that they had for his investigating because he had his own business which was very lucrative you know constructive business 
And I think he was just a victim of society, pretty much. He worked hard. Um, he got involved in drugs. I feel like he got addicted to drugs, which drove his behavior beyond, you know, you know, normal. You know, he, he, he was supporting, you know, five kids, a, a couple of his friends, whatnot. They all worked together. And they all use drugs together. And my problem is, if all of those people was kind of like in cahoots with each other, like a little family of drug dealing, and different one of them made money by, you know, making sales, other, you know, individually, whatnot, why is he the only one that's getting, you know, 28 years? All the rest of them getting treatment, you know, stuff like that, a lighter sentence treatment. You know, I don't think that's fair, you know, which, you know, he he, he he had a lot of responsibility. And if anybody was more, for me, if anybody was more to be rehabilitated, it should have been him, especially a man with kids. Yeah. We don't, we don't see that because of the color of his skin. Yeah. And I think that, you know, even with the, you know, with the informants, one of the informers was one of the people that he was buying from. It's like, you know, you buy from me and I tell that you buy so much from me a week and they give you a lighter sentence. He got, that guy didn't get for 60, 60 some months. That oh actually gosh. was Roger's supplier. I don't get that. You know, mm -hmm. that's crazy. And he was a white guy, but he told what he was doing and, told on everybody else, and he told that Roger was buying this. You know, well, why did Roger get so much time then? And once again, color of his skin. And, and, and they didn't see him as a person who needs help, as a person who needs uh, rehab, as a person who yeah. needs a, a medical um, treatment. They did not see him as that, you know. No. And, and that, that, that's, what, that's what gets me. I think uh, we were attending when the was talking about getting the stop act passed and all that uh i attended a meeting where josh stein um attorney general was present also it was like a town hall type setting and it was clear as day when the white couple came up and talked about their child going through dark drug uh, pain i think it was uh, oxycodone addiction that was, oh my gosh, that's an addict. That it needs help right now. We have treatment centers available. But when an African American lady stood up talking about her child, Josh Stein's attitude was like, well, you know, the criminal element. I was like, the criminal element? For him, for her child, it's a criminal element. But it was, and it's just amazing that um, those in our, uh, legal system, they they do not see the black person as a human being. They don't see them as a human being. There's nothing that needs uh, help or treatment. They don't see them as a human being, and they don't even realize it's so ingrained into them. They don't even realize when they're doing it. Um, and it, I I have no that that's what gets me that i think that for me is even the fight now as we are trying to uh, deal with our governor who by uh, forming that racial equity task force has admitted that the system is broken but for some reason knowing that the system is broken knowing that the system that condemned these men and women into these horrendous prison situations is broken he will fix the system, but not fix the wrong the system did. That's right. You know, there are thousands of lives languishing, thousands. Um, so he might... My sons, Rose's son, people's daughters and sons, there are thousands of people languishing as a, as a hurt from the system. And what I am wondering is at what point do we have truth and reconciliation? Like at the end of apartheid in South Africa. So, you, so you're saying that he might improve the situation going forward, but he's not going to go back into history and correct the injustices that have happened to but thousands of people is now. Not, this, this is not history. 
This is a house burning now. Well, right. This is not his. You know, <laughs> yes, the system has lit all these fires and camped around us. It's you happening know? now, and it's it's, it's now. Now. I guess yes. by history, I'm talking about any, anything earlier than 20 minutes ago. Oh my gosh! That, yeah, that but, kind of yeah, but not, uh, not 100 are, years ago, not 20 years ago, or even. Tw well, are, but the thing is that the hurt is continuing to happen. It's not like, you know, the moment of incarceration is not the end of the tragedy. It's the continued incarceration. Right. It's the uh, the the prison legal system, or you know, that, that now the prisoner is supposed to go and access for a lawyer. It's a joke. They you become vilified for reaching out. So, and there are those who just needed help. They just needed help. When someone shows up and they're addicted to drugs, we know to send them to treatment. To treatment. This is not someone. Um, I guess they say of sound mind, mensana. This is not someone of sound mind and body. No, they're not someone of sound mind and body. Do not treat what they're doing as an act committed by someone of sound mind and body. You know? What's, what's, amazing, what's amazing to me is the fact that they take the word of a, a person that's on probation or already dealing with the police or an addict. They'll take their word over yours okay i'm dealing with an addict they'll do anything for drugs they'll let them go out and sell drugs and whatnot and they can come back and say john doe gave this to me and they gotta then you know then it's john doe that's in trouble you know as a black man and, and for us with a previous history of of narcotics you know of 25 years ago it's actually dangerous for me because I can easily be tied into a conspiracy by just a addict saying, oh, I got this from Dwight. They could have came out and, you know, the police undercover could give them money to go purchase drugs. They can go out and purchase the drugs and come back and say, oh, I got this from Dwight. I got this from Dwight because that's who they really want you to get it from. So they'll lie about it. And, you know, they take that as evidence against you. And when you have nothing to do with it. So that's that's where the danger for me of for me of, of of using you know addicts and informants because they already if they are if they already are informants they already done broken the law they are already not trustworthy but here they come crime you know they they number number one witness against you and you haven't did anything you know that that, that thing right there is really dangerous to accountability. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you commit a crime, instead of getting a plea bargain or being able to tell on somebody, that, that it would help if they just go ahead and charge the person that they found guilty. Don't give them a plea. So, you know, I, I always use this as an example. You can break in my house and assault my wife, daughter, or whatnot, and as long as you can tell on a, 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 a big-time drug dealer, you just get a regular break of the in charge that, you know, the, all the other offenses to my family are thrown out. So they don't even go to jail for, you know, what they actually do. And this what this happens over and over again. I know a number of uh, informers. They have uh, continued to sell drugs. Mm. They have been to jail. They come back out. They still informers. Yeah, I think some of them are really working for some of the police officers because mm. the way things are. You know, they ain't even worried. You've been bustling, went, supposed to went to jail, but you can tell on somebody, you come out better, come out better often than you were before you left. That don't make mm. sense to the streets. You know, that person ain't working for the streets. Who are you working for? He's still working for the police. So he's still committing crimes. He's still making drug deals, making money, mm. moving up, you know, putting people's life in danger and all that. You know, for what? For the, for the, for the bust the next person? When you can actually stop a lot of the crime by not letting that criminal continue to do his business, you know it happens every day. The snitches is is, is doing better than the guys on the street. Mm. So whose drugs is the snitches selling? Mm. So Dwight, the what you're describing is this 
from experience that you've had inside the justice system or just observing it or where, where are you getting it? I've had actually experience inside the justice system. You know, the, the fact that 25 years ago, this same system, when, you know, I was selling drugs and had a lot of money, I could pay my lawyer for, uh, for charges and never even go to court mm. and they'd be dismissed. So I know it's there because I've used that system. And that shit, that system is over twenty some years old. Mm. You know, if you go to if you go to court right now, the judge really never has anything to do but sign sign his name, because the district attorney and your defense lawyer they make the deal before you even go. Yeah. That's why all these yeah. plea bargains are there. They scare these guys. They tell them, oh, if you go to trial, we, they gonna find you guilty, and you are gonna spend X amount of time in jail. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, why wouldn't I take the plea and say, okay, if I ain't got, if I already know I'm guilty, instead of going to going and, and, and get extra time added to me, I'm gonna take the plea. Other little ten years, starting to twenty years, you already know you 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 can't win. They're telling you you can't win. But I asked one lawyer before, you know, in Rogers' case, I asked him. I said, where's where's the where's the defense for the statute using the statute mm-hmm. of the law? You know, making these people accountable, stuff like that. You know, you know, all you get is, you know, two lawyers telling you what's going on. Judge, the judge half the time don't know half the things that's going on until you know it's sentencing. You know, you already guilty or you pleaded, and then he got his instructions what he gonna do. You know, it's it's it's, it's like you know they 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 playing with a lot of people's lives like that. To me. And just, I, like, I, and just like Dwight said, that they can say that they got these drugs from, you know, they can just drugs. go, you know, anywhere and say, I got these drugs from this person. And automatically they'll come out and try to arrest um, that person. So in one of Roger's cases, this girl says she got drugs from him. And he got a, um, I got a letter from a guy letting him know that he would never give this girl drugs because she was an addict. So... Mm-hmm. These drugs that they sent off to the lab, they still in the lab, but my son is serving 28 years when these drugs never was presented before the court. Mm. So, mm. Dwight, uh, with all the experience that you've had uh, in, in the system, are you still surprised at what happens, or is it just... You know, in, in, in this case with Roger, my wife... And verify, I predicted everything that was finna happen, laid it out. I even tried to tell them how to protect themselves so they didn't get in trouble. So, you know, I know this system. This system is targeted for blacks. It really is. I'm talking like, I'm not racist, but white people get in trouble and they do a lot more harm than we do. And they get a lighter sentence. It don't make sense. You know, you got a drug problem. You've been had it for three years and nobody offered you any counseling, take your children, all of that. And you still, they can take your children, but they can't mandate you to go to get rehab to get you some help. Mm. That don't make sense. You can take the kids from a person, but you can't say, well, you need to go here for 90 days and make you mandate you to stay there. I'm telling you, that's what I think authorities should do. You know, a lot of people abuse their authority, you know, in these situations. You oh, know, no and, I, and I really think it's a lot about it. A lot about it is, is how much money you can get towards your organizations. You know, is you know, it's systematic. You know, how they allocate funds, and if you're in that little system, if I'm working with Orange County, I know all the um, psychological people gonna come to me. I'm going to diagnose them with more problems than what they have yeah. because all they're doing is allocating funds. So all they use my family were for, for a number of people to get that opioid money. My grandkids didn't need no counseling, don't need no care. They need to come home. All, right. of that, all of that stuff that they, they, they done, uh, 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 put on paper to show the judges, all that, all of that. You know, that's, that's lies. They they don't call it. It's their perception of what they see. It ain't about what really is. So they can make it a perception 
and that's how they get away with it. So all you know, we have five five children, three four adults that's been the counselor. So who paid for all that? I even asked the question: Why are we here? You know, you're willing to pay for all of this. You're willing to send these kids through all of this stuff for what? You know, is that the only way you can allocate funds? You know, I knew that, you know, when, when you can allocate funds and, you know, you put this opioid, all of that money out there, Orange County has gotten rich the way they do it. My grandkids shouldn't even be in this system at all. They had a real sturdy background. We showed them how strong a background my family is. I got five veterans in my household. You tell me another household that has five veterans. So if I'm producing veterans, that means I'm producing high quality product of people of humanity. Mm -hmm. So why my wife can't see our grandkids? Why don't we have that effect for them? I'm telling you what, we are not good enough to raise our own grandkids when I don't produce this, no matter what my past is. Mm. No matter what my past is, it's about what I produce today. Mm. And I produce some fine kids. I got some great nephews and nieces, all mm. positive people. I, I got a family of over 150 uh, nieces and nephews. None of them have any drug dependencies or nothing. But you mm. send my grandchildren to a family full of drug dependent people. Mm. From the grandparents all the way to whoever they stand with today. Mm. And I suppose they accept that. So I'm a man. I suppose to say, oh, just let my grandkids stay over there. I'm not gonna fight for them. I'm not gonna show people that, you know, we got we have some intelligence too. I'm from a very prominent family, not just from the day. I'm talking about over a hundred years of prominent family to this mm-hmm. community. So why can't my family see our grandkids? Because we black and they white? That don't make sense to me. Uh, and you're talking about Orange County, it sounds like. Yes, I am talking about Orange okay. County, DSS service. You know, I got c- recorded conversations with some of the officials there that would be embarrassing to publicize. I have went and talked to certain women of, of their community, knowing that they're in position to change things, speak up, do something in the, about our situation. You know what they do? They come and sit there looking at me crying, saying that they can't do anything because of the Orange County Sheriff. He has so much power that this is who is ruling these people to make bad judgment. And I tell them, damn, you make it, you, you, if you know this and you're doing your job wrong, you're supposed to be doing your job, I can't even say it's racism because some of the people I go and deal with that's in position has been black. So I'm asking that black person that we voted to be in these positions to step up. And the only thing they say is I can't because the sheriff got so much power. So somebody tell me, is this how we, we, we run government here? Yeah, is Elizabeth. That the sheriff abuse his power? So that's exactly the what the problem is. That's the thing. That, that sheriff needs someone to check them. To check them because... Many of them have become, especially those who have been in office more than one term, you know, they have become these czars, you know, these, these I call them these criminal pimps, that you try and uh, raise your head, I will slap you both ways. Mm-hmm. Shut up and, and do what I tell you. And I keep wondering how many of them have shares in these prison systems? They're, they're making some kind of, they're just, they take so much energy to be that evil and they expand the energy over and over and over again. This is what's getting me. They're the stories of how outstanding and awesome an African-American couple can be. You've got a standing family compared to drug addiction white and drug addiction white will win out every time. This is, you're like the third family I've heard of the same situation. You're providing not only the household and you're providing something that other family, regardless how, of how much love they want to provide, they can never teach those children how to be strong black people. They cannot. 
Dwight? They have no clue what the boys are going to face come into the school system, middle school, high school. They have no clue what they're going to, the talk you're going to have to have of keep your hands on the steering wheel, you know, call me first. They, they have no clue what it takes to raise an African-American child in the United States of America. But they have been handed these children simply because they're not black. So and it's a money thing. It's a money thing, too, because they're um, giving them so much money per child. Now, and I, I, like I said, I haven't seen my grandchildren. It's a year today that I haven't seen them. And I feel like they took them out of our lives because one of the grandkids will come back and tell us what he's experienced. OK, he experienced one day that. um he went to, they let his grandpa live in the backyard in a trailer. And um, they went to the trailer and they told him not to eat because they're going to eat supper, you know, soon. So the grandfather did fix him a sandwich and they did eat. So when they come back, he found out that he ate. And our grandson told us during a um, DSS meeting that they made him go to bed without dinner that night. I don't know what my grandkids are experiencing. And I, 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 just, I just dream about them every night, almost wondering if he's okay. Or, you know, I don't know what's going on with them. But so I feel they, like they... Not, not only did they not give you custody, they don't let you visit? No. And did they... What, what reason, what excuse did they give you for not giving you custody? It's, 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 it's DSS told us we had a lawyer, DSS told us, and we continue to post things on Facebook, uh, contact uh, elected officials that our visit, that her visitation will be eliminated. Mine had already been terminated. And we met with a elected official on a Thursday. The following Tuesday, she got a note I mean, got an email saying that all visitation at DSS has been terminated. Mm. So somebody is using their political power to involve themselves in this custody case. You know, it's you know, I don't I don't feel like that's ever right because if you are DSS social services, you should be worried about the welfare of the child. You can hate me all you want, but if that child loves me and needs my my support, then that child deserves that in life. So you helping a child to, you know, might as well say, forget an entire race. He won't even know. They, what makes it so bad, they don't even have contact with their older sister. Mm. You know, they don't make sense. And she biracial too. So if you if you if you DSS and you family oriented and you worried about unifying families, what tell me the logic here? You know, it's a lot of issues that I got with DSS and the directors over there because uneducated as I am, I know for myself that you had acknowledgement of who was giving the mother narcotics. You had Acknowledgement that the police alleged and thought that Roger was a drug dealer. You had all of this information with DSS. So why would you choose Roderick over his grandparents, over the kid's grandparents of custody? Mm. You knew he was giving Nadia uh, narcotics or you was alleged to thought of that. Why would you? Why would? Why would you even say I'm gonna put this child there? I told him that. I said, cause that made no sense to me. I said because what you done, you put my grandchildren in danger. So you knew all of this about this person, which me and his mother had no idea, cause we thought you know he was, you know, all his money came from construction. So we very rarely seen him. We kept the kids because. He said he was doing jobs out of town or working. So mm. all of this come like a smack in the face to us. But when you read his paperwork, 
and you realize that these people already had a ledge and thought that this man was doing these things, and you put those kids with him, and you knew Bella was living in this house for four months. Mm. That baby was not in no danger. So why she's in? Why is she in it? I ain't understood why, why that. Does it all, why do why do you guys all of a sudden become danger when yeah. they? You know, and if Roderick himself thought that the best place for them was with you, you know, yeah. in all his struggles, he did the best. And, and place I asked, for them I asked DSS you. that. I said, "Why did you do that?" And you know, I got this on. I got this recorded on her for me asking her that question. She got no answer for. It. <laughs> it ain't like you. She acknowledged that she didn't know this was happening. You signed off documentation of something this important. So that tells me somebody's leading your step, and it ain't God. Mm. All right. Mm. You see, they, and all this came from the arrest, from the point of arrest, Gary. From yeah. the point of arrest, these are the issues. You know the ricocheting, you know this. the ricocheting. The, yeah, the story, the, say, story gets complicated. Oh yeah, the, you know Gary, it's like Gary, when you throw the story, a, a the story gets the more ball. complicated when I tell you this part. On March the fifth. Rose and Roger, after they, Roger got custody of the kids, right, he knew he couldn't raise the boys and work and go get help because he was trying to get himself together. The baby was already living in our house from December, from, from November to March the 6th. The baby was living in my house. Every day my wife and daughter took care of this child. Every day. March the 5th. I had talked before I had talked to Roger. He said he was going to get his self life together. So I told him the best thing you to do, let us raise your kids. You know, let us take care of the boys until you get yourself straight. M Roger and Rose went to the courthouse and filed papers for Rose to get custody of his kids. They, 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 they uh, notarized the paper for the clerk of court. On March the 5th at 2.59 p.m., the following day, they picked up all the keys. March the 6th, they picked up all the keys. Because mm. they knew that if the kids had came with us, that the, the informant that they had wouldn't have did what they wanted them to do. Mm. They paid her to tell on him, and they probably gave her a bunch of money because she just gave up her rights so frequently it didn't make no sense. It, it's an incredibly sad story. Uh, it is one, as I explained at the beginning of the show w before you were here, I can't verify anything you're saying because um, we don't have an investigative unit to go dig this out. But I did want to give you the opportunity to tell your story. What I want to ask you now is that we are in a somewhat, from my white suburban old guy perspective, somewhat unprecedented period in our history following the murder of George Floyd and all the protests that have been going on and a lot of white people showing up carrying Black Lives Matters banners um, across the country. Uh, actual elected officials seeming to begin to respond to some of that, maybe little incremental tiny changes happening. How do those things strike you guys? Do they, does, do they give you any hope? Maybe not for your individual circumstance, but for the country and for black people in general. Let me not for lead me, this anymore. Let me just ask you how that how it all strikes you. For me, it's it, 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 it's 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 like a change of heart in some of the white people, like the statues and stuff being down. It's like they're ashamed of their ancestors. You know where they come from. They want to they want to rewrite that part of it, to make themselves look better. But for us, white privilege, for us, for me, uh, the direction of Black Lives Matter has really lost its focus on, you know, changing society. In order to change society, you have to make everybody accountable. That means your judges, your lawyers, your DAs. When you got immunity still there, you know, that's like I can do wrong, but I got this law right here protecting me. How many people would take advantage of that? You know, if you get rid of immunity among everybody, 
and make everybody accountable. And police, when they're involved in drugs and murder, their charges should be more because they are the people that's in authority. They they the people that's supposed to they discipline me. So what how you gonna when when it comes to disciplining you, you got immunity. So what do that look like? That don't look like no change to me. That look like we're going to hide this, let this go. We're not going to talk about what really, really matters. Mm -hmm. When everybody's held accountable for their action, that's when the world will change. As long as you still got immunity for judges and people to do wrong, it ain't going to change nothing. Yeah, so that's one of the things that's on the table, but it could be a while before we see any progress, and there's no guarantee about and, what. And, and that's the thing. It shouldn't be a while. It shouldn't be a while. If they can meet at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you know, in the middle of the night to pass these horrible regressive situations, you know, if there's no more a while. It's been 400 years. There's no more a while. There's none, no more. There take should... a few minutes, take a, a shorter lunch break, go in <laughs> and make these changes. Yeah, there you shouldn't know. be, but you know there will be if it happens yeah. at all. And, and we can't live in the if anymore. We lived in the if for 400 years. We lived in the if. In fact, since the civil rights movement of the 60s, we've been living in the if, you know, if they decide or if they say, at this point, there's no more if. Let's do it. So, Rose, you know? once this happened to you, it sounds like you became more activist. Yes, um, I have um, because... For one thing, I, I want this justice system to do right. If they're going to do right, do right. Whether you black, white, brown, purple, or green, everybody should be sentenced on the same guidelines no matter what. Even with DSS, what they're doing, they don't care about these kids. It's all about money. Where this, like my husband said, money going this way, money going that way. And a lot of people that are getting these kids that are in the foster uh, system, they getting money. They getting paid. It ain't about the love they have for these kids. It's about making their pockets fed. They don't care about, you know, that child or just like it, where my kids are now. I thought the, um, the uncle cared enough about them. He let me see them. One time without letting DSS um, know about it. And then all of a sudden, he had to let them know about it. And I feel like um, the police, Charles Blackwood, our sheriff here, had a lot to do with that because um, of some of the things that happened. But if, if they don't start doing, like my husband said, Getting some of these people off the street, these informants, they're going to continue to do the same thing. And they, because a the guy told me the other day, all he got to do is go see Charles Blackwood and he ain't got to worry about nothing because he going to get him off. And it shouldn't be like that. If we don't change the system and get some of these people out of office and put some new people in there that's going to do right, it's just like you say, it's going to take a while. <laughs> That's going to take a while anyway. I wish I could tell you a different story. Yeah. Uh, I like to to uh, include on any of the programs that I do that have something like this going on, at least sort of an action step, something that anybody out there in the audience could actually do. Is there anything that people can do? Um, we've got an election coming up. Is anybody oh. running that is going to, that gives you hope? Um. For me, on the on the statewide level, um, at, as in Council of State officers, no, no one really gives me any hope there. We're just, we're messed up. Well, whatever we do, we are messed up for another four years. Is a Democratic governor another, any better than a Republican governor? I, I, right now, um, it's the humanity of the governor. I don't care what their party is. And uh, right now, both ways, we are messed up. As minorities, so, we so, have to we have to look at our uh, state legislation, legislative, so the NCGA, to see if we can make changes there because those changes will be uh, quicker and easier to come by. Um, 
we are we are in the fight this is like a four-year fight but there's some things that need to happen like right now like right now even for us to even think of what is going forward there is no going forward if the ship is still sinking you can't say i recognize there's a hole in the ship and we're going to meet and discuss how to not make any more holes in the ship when the ship is still sinking fix the hole <laughs> then talk about how you're not going to make any more holes okay, in the ship I, I, we're a sinking ship at this point I get the feeling that you we know. could have had this very discussion a year ago, two years ago, ten years ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, yeah, but but now, but now they they have they have admitted to the sinking of the ship. Before we'd be saying the ship is sinking, and they'd say, "Oh no, the you know they're just exaggerating about the water level," yeah. you know. But now they have the powers that be have recognized that the ship is sinking. So just just Stop like the discussing plan forward how we wouldn't make it sink anymore just like discussing the progress that black people have made there are a lot of white people that say well the problem solved you guys you have parity look at all the athletes look at all the movie stars you know what what are you complaining about and that's certainly not the case okay so we got black lives matter marches all over the country problem solved it's not it's not it's not i'm like where where is the policy change where is the correction where is that like i said um the best way i can describe is the best scenario i can describe is when um south africa came to the quote-unquote end of apartheid the release of nelson mandela did not equal the end of apartheid the reconciliation had to happen there had to be a moment of reconciliation and North Carolina, United States in general, but North Carolina, because that's where we are, needs that moment of reconciliation. That's my son calling me from prison, um, you need to which talk is to amazing. Him. Yeah, we, we, might, we might be able to get, get a, a special talk, but yeah, he's going to call back. Okay. But that, that moment of reconciliation, and this is the, the, the so how does... amazing thing about the spirit of the people in prison. My son is calling He's saying, Mama, you know, fight for me. But he said, Mama, I found so-and-so. They've been in here 30 years. They couldn't read. And they were charged with 12 counts of rape of a woman he'd never seen. But because he couldn't read, and this was back in the uh, uh, late 80s, conviction came in the early 90s, he couldn't read. He thought he was coming to court because the DNA showed it wasn't him. Um, to go home, but um, he signed it, and he's in there on two life sentences plus fifty years. Mm. You know, two, two, two life sentences plus fifty years. He's in there, and uh, he can't fill out any paperwork because he can't read, and there's no one to help him. There's your we son. have so many new uncles, cousins, friends that. We want to fight for Shannon, but bring everybody out. So it has to be a that's, systemic change. That's right. And then there's a lot of them that are in, in prison that don't have families to help them out. You know, they need, that's why I'm out here trying to help because maybe it'll bring some of them home because it's got, you know, they got families that don't even support them. Okay, I think Elizabeth is trying to see if she can get her son on the on the speakerphone. We'll see if that uh, see okay. if that works and hang on here a little bit longer. One of the okay. great things about a podcast is uh, we don't have to we don't have to be done for the next show to come on. Okay, <laughs> can go along. Yeah, let me ask you a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You willing to answer? You, you willing to answer a question? Yeah. From from your point of view, what do you think Black Lives Matter have accomplished? Not much yet, but yeah, re remember, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a guilty suburban white liberal, and, um, you know, so as I look at it, I'll say, it, it, I, I and I knew because because I've seen this so many times before, this is a baby step if it's a step at all. I'm, I guess I'm surprised. Yeah, but, I'm surprised that the that the marches have carried on as long as they have um and i am happy that they keep on going and maybe this time maybe this time 
we'll actually get something <clears throat> that um, that improves, but I don't expect it <clears throat> or expect the minimum. Because I think, you know, like I tell mine and the people that I talk to, you know, I think Black Lives Matter focus is on, you know, rights that we already supposed to have. <laughs> they ain't giving us a damn thing. No. It's shit we supposed to have. It's something, you know, we fight for something we supposed to already have. There's already saying that we got it. And you fighting for it today? That's what's embarrassing because that's why I tell them, you know, we had a black president. As a black man, you know, at that time right there, I was just in much danger as I am right now. Because, you know, crime was a lot higher then, and, you know, police was doing things that people wouldn't even, you know, they didn't even acknowledge. You know, you didn't have social media all the way up reporting and telling you everything that happened every day in all of your community. You know, most of the time, you didn't, if you weren't involved with police officers, you didn't even know anything that they was doing. Yeah. But and now today, with, with, with being able to capture things on camera and your phone, you know, you get a little more information faster and whatnot. Because a lot of people ask, if that little girl had never videoed George Floyd, where would we be at right now? That story would be long gone. Yeah. Yeah. Been long gone. And, and why is it all still the case? Because there are racist white Americans seeded throughout the entire system. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Uh, and positions of authority that 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 the way I've held for decades and and decades, and rooting that out because they're still going to be there. How do we just? How do we take? We're not going to. We're not going to change their minds. We no, need to take. We, their need, mind, we need to take away their if power. You, if, you, if, you, if you, yeah, if you, if you, uh, if you take that immunity out of that, out of their thing, out of their. Uh, uh, line of defense it'll help a whole lot yeah I think once that, once once one person is punished severely the next person wouldn't do it yep yeah, it'll, it'll be highly likable that a person would do it yeah and that's one of those points in the uh you know eight can't wait um that people are working for and we'll see how far that gets uh, i hope it gets a long way so, I mean, we need to remove their power. We need to remove them from their positions of authority. We need to put many of you in those same positions of authority and in, instead. And then maybe the society is going to become more balanced. I don't know. I, you know I'd like to see that happen. I can't barely imagine it. Um, maybe the, the, you know, the best thing that we're getting right now is just recognizing more what's really going on. So Elizabeth is uh, her video is back on. I'm not sure where we stand on. Uh... Aha! <laughs> that's not her son. That's her husband. That's her husband. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Hi. Hi Welcome back. It's been a while since we've had you on the show. Yes, it has. I'm very happy about uh, what's going on. We need to get the word out about the injustice going on, uh, present day, present, present day North Carolina system, and uh, need to change from the privatized system and get people justice. Yeah, I don't know if, how much you've been able to listen to what we've been doing on the show so far, but. Uh, uh, um, is you were saying the privatized. Privatized justice system? Explain that. Well, it's the privatized corporate justice system, prison, prison system, I mean, that, that created a lot of the problem we had here. Uh, now it's enslaving African-Americans and making it into a form of, of, uh, of punishment and to make money and profit off their enslavement into our prison systems. They're not looking for justice. They had justice. They could have had justice. They've been dealing with this meeting with Elizabeth for about two years on Shannon's case. And we've been dealing with other people's cases. And uh, relatively, you have had no one set free. You've had no justice done by either uh, Governor Cooper or Attorney General Josh Stein. 
Um, we believe that when you and the, the Democratic Party takes place in allowing privatized prison system to occur and actually support it, then we're talking about a new steps in the wrong direction for the, for the party and an insult to all African Americans and Native Americans as well that are cooped up in these conditions of unfair and unjust sentences and conditions. So when you say privatized, I guess that's what I'm not understanding. It's, it, privatized there are some... means making a profit on these prison systems. And they are. Todd Ishii, who came from a privatized operation in Ohio, was brought here by our governor to push the privatized prison system here in North Carolina against um, Democratic platform. They, he did this because they needed the money from the corporates involved in this for our campaigns. We believe that this is a money thing and has backfired because now we see by their actions inside the prison, by inability to set people free or even even hear their cases in some cases, these, these people have a right to due process. There should have been a criminal case brought up on them when they asked for it and should have been heard but never was. Right now in the prison system in, uh, in Lumberton Correctional Facility, you have all sorts of horrible things being done, such as the air conditioning being shut off, um, food rations cut in half, and, uh, and, just, and just bright lights left on at night so they can't sleep. This was done to punish them for bringing a lawsuit forward to begin with against COVID-19. To purposely infect inmates in my opinion, is a crime. And to do this knowingly, to get back at them for the death of other prisoners, at least that's what we're told by many, is a very sick thing. Um, many guards had died, and me and Elizabeth were alerted by people also in, uh, in the state, uh, workers in the system, who some have been fired for, for mentioning that we need help and somebody better set the alarm. Well, we set the alarm. And in it, we find a lot of people being punished just because of their uh, their nationality and racism. Um, at Lumberton, you're talking about many Native Americans as well that are being unjustly treated. Um, again, there's a large number of people whose cases have never been heard. And we need to find out how many and get the cases heard. Uh, Governor Cooper is running. He's pretending that he, oh, he didn't know these things. This has been his career, his entire, this has been his entire career. Why does he not know anything about the prison systems, the justice system? He came up from state's attorney, right? Well, when he was uh, the state attorney. Why does Josh Stein all of a sudden not know? You know, we've been telling him for two years. He's actually been in our discussions, and we've talked to him, as many of you have probably written him letters to try to get a response. When they become politicians, they become focused away from what's going on in their business. They become centered around what their politicians tell them to act and say and what's good, instead of finding out what's really going on. We believe racism is the bottom of this, whether Democratic or Republican, and we believe that the justice system needs to be overhauled completely. First, the governor has to get rid of Todd Ishii from a commissioner of prisons, because most of this happened under his watch. So we don't want Dan Forrest as the next governor, but you don't really hold out much hope for Roy Cooper for doing anything either. Well, the point is, it's not a question. I don't like Dan Forrest. I think he's an abomination to someone, a typical politician running for office who doesn't know what he's doing. The point is, at some point, it's not a question of politics. It's a question of what the issue is. And the issue is that if Roy Cooper and Josh Stein cannot turn around what they've been doing in the past so many months and not turn around what they're doing and say, hey, look, this is not democratic. This is not fair. This is not just this is racism. And we need to stop it. And we're going to go do an about face. If they do not do that, why should we vote for them? They don't represent us. They don't represent most people in the Democratic Party, either core beliefs or otherwise. And we should not stand up for injustice. In my opinion, this is actually handing into the criminal specter and should be investigated. Okay, so I guess the question for me is, uh, who are you going to vote for 
in uh, November. And, and Rose, you can answer that question too. And Rose, you could too. But as right far now, as I, for governor, I feel, it, I feel about it right now that the Democratic Party has to know that you can't have people run that are against the core beliefs and the platform of the Democratic Party. And I'm tired of disenfranchising minorities in this party. It's about time we have to make a stand. If they're not willing to change and force us to vote for them because of royalties, what are we loyal to? Are we not loyal to what we who and we, we are and to fighting injustice, even when it's in our own backyard? We need to make a stand. If Roy Cooper cannot turn this around and undo the damage he has done, if we do not turn around and change the leaders of our state Democratic Party to people who are more in line with Democratic core values, we should not be forced to vote for them. That is what they count on, us feeling sorry for them and voting for them because we're going to vote for them anyway. Why should they listen to us? But we have to make a stand. Is it, is it too late this election? Is the price to pay. Well, is it too I late? We change it. Is it too late this election cycle, or can you still get get something changed? It's not November yet, and uh, we should put the pressure on Governor Cooper to change his values and his ways. You said you didn't know all this was going on. Of course he did. We told him. Me and Elizabeth Crudup, we told him, and others. They sent letters. He never answered. He never responded. At some point, being a Democrat is not more important than being a human being. And the treatment of people in prisons right now is 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 criminal and inhumane and we have to make a stand on that alone humane stand if governor cooper keeps talking to the side of his mouth knowing that we're all going to like always turn around and vote for the democrats anyway whether they're good or not then we made a mistake i like to see i don't want to see dan forrest in but i don't want to see either josh stein or Governor Cooper ever again represent the Democratic Party. Rose, does the Democratic Party uh, take take you for granted? Do you feel? I feel as though they do, and I'm I'm undecided right now. But I feel just like he just said, just because we're Democrats, they think we just supposed to vote Democratic. But for me, if I don't feel like he's doing anything, I just won't vote. Does that um, extend to uh, the president as well? Or can you? How do you feel about uh, Joe Biden? Oh Lord! That's, <laughs> uh, all I can say is Oh Lord, because that's a hard whip right there. Because um, I don't. Some of the things that he's he's saying, I don't agree with. And Trump is just like, Oh wow! Where do you go? Well, the question is, mm. if I may say, uh, the yeah. question is, we we have we have progressives for a reason. It's a change the Democratic Party's platform and what it is doing. We need to address issues, and we need to always address issues on what their value is, and we should always fight injustice, even when it's within our own party. And I believe we should remain doing that. But we must remove people such as Pelosi, Schumer, and others who in the future who have voted against Black Lives Matter and said, hey, we don't want to hear this or on the this on the platform. And I think that's wrong, that we should keep supporting people who do not support or believe in our beliefs. And I think, yes, we, we're going to fight Trump all the way because he's no good. And I like to fight Dan Forrest. But this is in the future is telling us that we have to be the ones who choose our candidates, not our party leaders. Yeah, I agree. Better yes. people. That's and our conundrum this year. For them ourselves and voting on primaries. All right. I think it's about time to wrap up. This has been quite a program and took a little turn there toward the end, but a good one. Alan Longman, thank you very much for uh, jump, jumping in. Elizabeth, can you hear me? Are, are we? Yes, I can. <laughs> okay. Put that microphone up somewhere by you guys. Yeah, uh, yeah it is. Okay. So um, thank you for bringing Rose and Dwight. Uh, Rose and Dwight, thank you for coming on the program. Um, and we don't make progress here on the show, but we let people know what, what people think. And I think we got a good, 
uh, representation of that on the show. So thank you both for coming coming on. Uh, we're going to call Happy. this uh, call this episode um, convicted, innocent question mark justice question mark. I, I suppose we still have the question marks. I'm not sure. July twenty second episode one hundred and two. From the Triangle Talk Show, uh, my name is uh, Gary Pierce. And what am I today? I'm a snowflake in summer. I'm <laughs> melting. <laughs> I'm melting. Thank you guys very much for being on the show. Thank All right. You. Thanks for having Bye-bye. us. And I'm pushing the off button after I say the magic words. Over and out. <laughs>